Hey, welcome to another biology lesson on Make Science Easy. Today, we're going to be looking at classification. In this lesson, we're going to be thinking about what classification is and why it's so important. So, let's start off by looking at these shapes. What does this have to do with classification, you ask? Well, that's a pretty good question. But we can classify anything. Classification is the process of putting things into groups. So, what groups do you think we could put these things into? Have a minute to think about it. Pause the video if you need, and then when you're ready, carry on. So, the first and the simplest way we can classify things is by the very shape they're in. So we've got triangles, hexagons, circles, and squares. Each of these shapes are different. We can obviously classify them by their shape. But how else could we do it? Well, we can classify things by their color. Obviously, we have blue, we have red, we have green. All perfectly valid ways of classification. Or, we can go by their size. Large shapes, small shapes. Again, perfectly valid. Finally, we can go on whether a shape has a solid color or if it doesn't have a solid color. All of these are perfectly good ways of classifying things. So, what is classification? It's putting things into groups, and literally anything can be put into a group. So, as we've already said, classification is the process of putting things into groups. Literally anything can be put into a group. You can classify anything you want. It's especially true of living things because it makes it easier to study. It's much easier to study a group of living things if we're studying similar things and we're looking at their similarities than if we're randomly comparing. Most classification is done on physical features and we're going to be looking at the physical features we might classify things in later on in this lesson and in this unit. Classification also happens on many levels, so you might not choose one feature to classify things with, but you might start off with one and then add more features in as we go. For living things, the first level of classification we have is by putting them into things that are known as kingdoms. Kingdoms are large groups of organisms, and these large groups of organisms share features with each other. And we're going to learn about these five kingdoms in a bit. So, the five kingdoms, we have something called Monera, Protocista, Fungi, Plantae, also known as plants in everyday language, and Animalia. Again, we would just call them animals in everyday language. If you look at these pictures, you can see there are some similarities and some differences. But if we go deep enough, we're going to be able to see what those differences are. The next kingdom we're going to look at are the kingdom of Monera. These are single-celled organisms. This means they only have one cell in their body, never more than one. Monera are the simplest forms of life. There's nothing simpler than them. Most Monera are blue-green algae, but there are some other examples too. The most important thing about Monera is that their chromosomes are not organised into a nucleus. This means that the chromosomes are just floating free in the cytoplasm of the cell. This is very, very different to all of the other kingdoms. Our next kingdom is Protocista. Protocista are fairly similar to Monera, but they are unicellular organisms. They only have one cell in their body. The big difference between Protocista and Monera is that in Protocista, the chromosomes are found in the nucleus. This is the easiest way of telling the difference between the two. But Protocista also have other more advanced features. Some of them contain chloroplasts that help them to produce food. This is very similar to plants. Other Protocista might absorb and digest food. This is similar to animals. Also, Protocysta have the ability to move. Now this is very, very different from Monera. They can either move by making the cytoplasm, the jelly within their cell, flow, 
or they may have hairs on the outside of their body called cilia. These can move in a wave-like action. Or they might have a whip called a flagellum. Again, this can move in a whip-like action, a bit like a boat, a rowing boat perhaps, making them move. So protocysta are more advanced than monera. The next thing that we need to look at is the kingdom of fungi. These might look very similar to plants, but in actual fact, they're very, very different. The first big difference is that they don't contain cells. They contain thread-like hyphae. Fungi are sometimes microscopic, quite small, sometimes macroscopic, quite large. We can see macroscopic things with our eyes. Another big difference between plants and fungi is that fungi do not have their genetic material in a nucleus. It's spread out throughout the cytoplasm of their hyphae. Plants produce their own food through photosynthesis. Fungi cannot produce their own food. This means they need to consume something else. And they do this by digesting dead organic matter which they actually grow on. This makes them part of a group called saprotrophs. Now, the groups we've looked at, or I should say the kingdoms we looked at so far, the protocyster and the monera, they generally reproduce asexually. This means they make copies of themselves. Fungi are far more sophisticated. Fungi reproduce using spores. This means that there's genetic variation and there is sexual reproduction going on. Fungi are also very useful. We use them to make things like bread, to make cheese, to make alcohol, and we use them quite often. In fact, we eat things like mushrooms as well. So fungi really are a very, very useful kingdom for us. The next kingdom we're going to look at is the kingdom of plants. Most plants are multicellular. Not all of them, but most. They vary in size from being very, very small, microscopic, to absolutely huge. The largest organisms on Earth at the moment are the giant redwood trees. They are huge, huge, huge trees. One of the key features that plants have that no other kingdom has is that the cells contain a compound called cellulose. This is used for plants to make things like their cell walls. Plants also contain chloroplasts. Chloroplasts are used by the plants to produce their own food in photosynthesis. They turn carbon dioxide and water into glucose and oxygen. Some protocysta can do this, but it is mainly plants that have the ability to produce their own food. The final kingdom we're going to look at is the kingdom of animals. This is the kingdom that we belong to. Animals are generally multicellular, and the big difference between animals and plants is that animal cells do not contain cell walls. This is because animals do not contain cellulose. Also, animals do not contain chloroplasts, that means we cannot create our own food by photosynthesis. Animals need to get their energy and their food by digesting other organisms and obtaining the nutrients. When we think about classifying things, we need to make sure that everyone is using the same system. If people are using different systems, well, their classification isn't going to be the same, and this means it's not going to work. Every single scientist needs to be classifying in the same way. And the system that we all use was developed originally by a scientist called Carl Linnaeus. He worked mainly on plants when he started to classify those, but as he got on and he developed his system, he decided to work with animals as well. It's not exactly the same system that we use today. It's been refined and improved over time, but he would still recognise it. And this is the system he used. First of all, everything was put into a kingdom. These are the general features that we've already seen are five kingdoms, and organisms within a kingdom are loosely related. He then puts things into a phylum. Things in a phylum are slightly more closely related than in a kingdom. Into a class, a subclass, an order, a family, a genus, and finally down to a species. Things within the same species are incredibly closely related. So as we go through Linnaeus' system, every level we go, things are more closely related. Linnaeus also developed another system, a naming system, and it's called the binomial naming system, and this is because every species has two names. This is their genus and their species. So every single species has two names, and we still use the system today, and these binomial names are usually... 
So, binomial naming is the naming system that we use today. Species are named by their genus and their species. Regardless of which language is being spoken, the species name remains the same because it's in Latin. Now, when we write a species name, it needs to be written in italics. Now, this is pretty easy if we're using a computer. If we're handwriting, it's not always so easy. So, if you're writing a species name, you should underline it. Now, the first letter of the genus must always be a capital letter, but the first letter of the species should be lower letter. So, remember, genus, species. First letter of the genus, capital. First letter of the species, lowercase so let's think about humans as an example we are homo sapiens homo is our genus has a capital h sapiens is our species has a lowercase s our binomial name is homo sapiens we could also look at some close relatives of ours neanderthals now these are also part of the genus homo which means they are closely related to us so, they form Homo neanderthalensis. Homo, their genus, Neanderthal, their species. Capital, lower... So, in summary, scientists classify living things to make them easier to study. The first level of all classification is to put organisms into one of the five kingdoms. Monera, Protocista, Fungi, Plantae, Animalia. We then classify all living things a little bit further. All living things are given a binomial species name. For example, Pantroglodytes, which is a chimpanzee, by the way. Classification, however, is not always easy, and it's sometimes very challenging to classify an organism completely. Now, I hope you've learned a lot in this lesson. In the rest of this unit, we're going to do some more classification. Remember... Make sure you use the resources provided with this lesson. Make sure you have a go at the multiple choice quiz. Make sure you've understood things. If you haven't, give everything another go. Until next time, hope I made science easy for you. Goodbye.